Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and I am here today at the Musée des Armes de Liège, the Liège Arms Museum, part of the Grand Curtius uh, museum complex. So they have a setup here in Liège with a whole bunch of museums relating to the city, all under one roof, and one of them is the Arms Museum. And they have a tremendous collection of very interesting firearms, including the earliest known Mauser Norris rifle, which is to say the earliest known Mauser rifle in existence. So the backstory to this I think is really interesting, um, and not just because the French Chassepo actually had a guiding hand in creating the world's most successful bolt-action rifle ever, but that's a separate thing. Uh, what happened here was the Mauser brothers, Paul and Wilhelm Mauser, in 1867 or thereabouts, came up with their own rifle design. Uh, and these are a couple, a pair of brothers from this small, poor, backwater town, Oberndorf, in Germany. Uh, their father had been a gunsmith, they took up the trade, and they were talented, they were bright, but there aren't a lot of opportunities for advancement in what will become Germany at that time. So they came up with their rifle design, and they were excited, and they sent it to Vienna for Austrian army trials in 1867, and it failed. Uh, the Austrian army wasn't interested in it. However, it was spotted by a guy named Samuel Norris. Norris was a sales representative for the Remington Company, and he was attending these rifle trials trying to sell Remington rifles. And he noticed the Mauser Brothers rifle, and it occurred to him that this rifle might have some real potential to it, some potential the Austrians didn't see. So he came back from the trials, and he got in contact with the Mauser Brothers, and he signed a contract with them to pay them to develop this rifle for him. So the original patents are co-signed uh, with both the Mauser brothers and Norris. And what Norris saw in this rifle was not a standalone rifle, he saw an opportunity to convert French chassepots to a cartridge, a metallic cartridge firing design, because the Mauser system, the Mauser bolt action system, looked really compatible with the chassepot. So uh, he brought the Mauser brothers to here in Liège, it's part of the reason that this rifle survives here today, and put them to work. And the, the contract was to be paid in 10 annual segments. So in theory it should have been about a 10-year contract. Now at this point uh, the Mauser brothers are very happy to have this opportunity, the potential, you know, maybe their rifle will actually go somewhere um, and they can get rich and famous. Norris start, so they start working on the gun, uh, developing rifles exactly like this one. Norris goes to work trying to sell this conversion to the French. And that's where things kind of go bad. So before we find, finish out what happened to this story, let's take a look at what Paul and Wilhelm Mauser were actually making here. So based on the idea of selling this as a Chassepot conversion, this rifle is largely a Chassepot. Now it's not a French military Chassepot. Those probably would have been relatively difficult for a private entrepreneur to get in 1868, and that's when this particular rifle was patented. Uh, instead, this is a Belgian-made, or at least Belgian-proofed, the ELG in a circle mark here on the barrel is a Belgian-proof Chassepot rifle. We've got the standard Chassepot sight there, we've got uh, the barrel band uh, that is exactly the same as the Chassepot pattern, the front end of the rifle has a Chassepot cleaning rod, Chassepot bayonet lug, nose cap, front sight, uh, these guns were being made under contract for the French in Belgium, in Liège, at the time, and so it would have been relatively uncomplicated for Mauser Brothers or Norris to arrange to buy a commercial version of the Chassepot. Once they had that, all they had to do was go ahead and build their own bolt mechanism for it. So the Chassepot is interesting in that it is one of the... it's a very early bolt-action rifle, and it shares it's a very modern profile bolt-action rifle, and that's what made it uh, easily adaptable to metallic cartridges, both as Norris, as the Mauser Norris did it, uh, the Germans would convert Chassepots to metallic cartridge in a couple of patterns after the Franco-Prussian War, and of course the French would do it themselves, converting to the Gras pattern. So this has a single locking lug right here, which locks against the receiver. This was different than the Chassepot pattern, where the, uh, the bolt handle came out here, and the locking lug was the root of the bolt handle. And this one, the bolt handle has been moved to the back because it incorporates the striker. 
see we have a couple little Belgian proofs on the bolt there. We then have a pretty unique striker spring system. This looks like the Beaumont with a flat spring, a V-spring inside the bolt. In reality, this is the striker spring. So when I push this in and cock it, you can see the back part of the bolt bending off right there. That is what puts tension on this for it to uh, propel the firing pin when you pull the trigger. Like that. So if I open this up and re-cock it, you can see that's, uh, that is applying your spring tension to the striker. They actually threaded the bolt face into place. Those are those two rectangular holes. The center hole is for the firing pin of course, and they have fixed an extractor to the outside of the bolt body there. We have a cut in the side of the receiver to fit the extractor, and then it's also cut up around the barrel so that when you rotate the bolt, the extractor is able to rotate around the case head, around the face of the barrel. I can actually close this without cocking it by holding the trigger down and closing the bolt that way. That uh, the, the sear is located right in here and it just directly catches the back end of the bolt to hold it back for firing. It's neat to see the, uh, the high polished sort of commercial blue on this gun. Uh, early Chasse at this point would have been produced and, and accepted all in the white, so you'll, you'll never really see a blued one like this, and that's pretty cool. So before we go back to the story, I should point out that uh, there are sources all the way back to 1914 that identify this as the earliest known Mauser Norris, um, specifically referring to its, its being in the, the museum at Liège. Uh, this museum in Liège was put together by a, these, basically the same confederation of small gunsmithing shops that would eventually form FN, uh, and these shops and companies had all gone around and, and bought up uh, all sorts of guns on the commercial market for, a, for reference collections. And they went ahead and combined all of those into a firearms museum, uh, I believe in the 1890s. So this particular rifle was actually donated to uh, P.J. Lemille, who was the founder of the museum, uh, by Samuel Norris himself. So it's been here basically, uh, well, at least since 1890 something. That's a, a pretty good provenance for a gun in a museum collection. All right, back to our story. Uh, Norris goes to the French and tries to sell them this bolt action conversion. And the French aren't interested. The French have very consciously made this decision not to use metallic cartridges. They were concerned about the, uh, the availability of ammunition in the field, like they didn't want to have all of their ammunition based on a like one or two cartridge production factories that something might go wrong with. The Germans might capture them, they might break, they might explode. You know, ammunition is a dangerous thing sometimes. They liked the idea of paper cartridges that could be very easily made almost anywhere. So the French turned down Norris. Well, at the same time, Remington, who is Norris's employer, and like they're the ones paying for him to be in Europe here, uh, they get wind that Norris is trying to make this deal with the French under his own name. Not, not for Remington, but for Samuel Norris. And this obviously leaves them a bit unhappy, and they fire Norris. So by 1869, this leaves Norris in the unfortunate position of not having enough money to continue making his payments to the Mauser brothers, not having a job with Remington anymore, and having gotten rejected by the French. So his whole ambitious plan of I'll hire these guys to make the rifle and then I'll sell it to those guys, this whole plan falls apart, and uh, Norris is forced to basically uh, liquidate his contract with the Mauser brothers. Um, as a result of this, the Mauser brothers walk away uh, retaining the rights to the patents that they filed. And this would become very valuable to them because the one last thing that they do with Samuel Norris is they convince him to help them out at the end and submit the rifle or present the rifle to the German uh, military, the GPK. And the German military at this point actually starts to see some interest in this. Um, cartridge firing rifles are substantially better than, uh, than paper cartridge firing rifles. and the Germans uh, would work for several years on this, and ultimately this would develop into the Gewehr 1871, which was the first cartridge firing, metallic cartridge firing rifle adopted by the German military uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War. So of course, the Germans were still using the Dreyse needle fire 
in the Franco-Prussian War, and that war teaches them very conclusively that, first off, the Dreyse is substantially inferior to the French Chassepot, and perhaps more importantly, more fundamentally, that metallic cartridge rifles are vastly superior to paper cartridge ones. So they would go ahead and develop this into their first standard metallic cartridge rifle, and that would begin the process of the Mauser brothers becoming one of the most successful firearms companies really in world history. So this is an incredibly cool piece of firearms history and Mauser company history, being the earliest known example of one of these rifles, which is of course the earliest known rifle made by the Mauser brothers. So a big thanks to the Liège Arms Museum uh, for giving me access to uh, having this rifle. A big thanks to the Paul Mauser Archive for helping to coordinate the visit. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. If you ever are in Liège, don't hesitate to uh, stop in and see the Arms Museum here. It is one of the few Arms Museums left that really displays a lot of guns. Um, it's a gun museum. They display guns. Um, it's not one of the more modern, more contextual museums. So if you're looking for firearms on display, the Liège Museum is a great place to see them. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching.